Mr. Tom Meyer, who is uh, uh, a long friend, long-standing friend with Kevin. He's known Kevin for over 10 years. So Tom, I'll pass it on over to you to introduce sure. Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Paul, and, and hello to everybody. Uh, Tom Beyer here from my living room in Tokyo. It's 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, so I guess good morning to everybody as well. Um, yeah, this is an exciting presentation, I think, tonight. Um, Kevin and I met, yeah, I can't really remember, but it's been at least over 10 years, maybe even 15, um, at one of the coaching conventions. And, and I've got his book right here. This is a Bible. Um, Paul and I were just talking about this right before we got on to the call here when everybody came on, but this is a book that you want to run out and buy, trust me. Um, and the interesting thing about Kevin is, is that Kevin is, is a coach who is so far ahead of his time. He was doing this kind of work um, for decades and not under the banner of, of scanning, but soccer IQ. That, that's basically his methodology that he pioneered years ago um today we you know the popular kind of buzzword is scanning um but this is an incredible book kevin has worked around the world he's worked both on the men's side he's worked on the women's side uh a real coaches coaches educator of coaches um he's been an instructor on the pro you know uefa pro licensing courses a courses b courses we could not get a more qualified person to talk about scanning um, then Kevin. So with no further ado, Kevin, um, we'll pass the baton over to you and uh, good luck. Yeah, thanks very much for the intro, Tom. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Yep. 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 Great. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for the intro. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to sharing some thoughts and ideas with, with everybody. Um, before we get into it, you know, I appreciate the kind words about the book. Obviously, I'm very delighted with how it's turned out and, you know, it's my thoughts and opinions. But what I'm always keen to say and stress is that this is a way to, to train and develop scanning um, the way I do it. I think we've all got to acknowledge the importance of scanning, how we find our, our way of doing that with our group of players that fits them. You know, that's still the debate. But this is a way. I'm not saying it's the way. Um, but hopefully uh, the coaches out there will find the, the ideas and the discussions useful. So um, if you want me to get straight into that, I'll uh, get my presentation up and we'll, we'll, we'll crack on and, unless there's anything else, Tom. No, I think that's fine. We'll dive right into it and then uh, it'll give us time for some Q&A because usually we have a lot of questions. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, as Tom says, uh, I've been involved in, in well I've been involved in coaching for years I was fortunate I coached in in Scotland maybe some of you detect the, the subtle hint of an accent uh, um, so yeah I'm, I'm Scottish I, I coached in Scotland uh, at the men's professional level with Patrick Thistle and Dundee United and as Tom mentioned I've, I've done a lot of coach education as well around the world uh, I've worked for the Irish, Irish FA for quite a number of years presenting on the the UEFA Pro License, A License, B License courses. Also done that, you can see a picture there with the Croatian FA. I got invited out there to present on their A License and B li uh, sorry, A License and Pro License courses as well. Uh, the picture at the top that you see, there's Ryan Gold. He's currently playing in the MLS now with the Whitecaps. Uh, he was at Dundee United when, when I was there as a coach. Um, he broke through into the first team while we were there. And we implemented all the ideas at, at Dundee United and Partick Thistle. And top left, big handsome guy, fantastic haircut. And that's me showing off my book. Um, but really, so scanning how to train it and develop game awareness. We'll, we'll go through a bit of the theory, underpinning theory, because I think that's important. I know as coaches, we always want to get to the, the session side of things, but it's important that we understand why we're doing something and then how we're going to try and do it. So we'll talk about this uh, through, throughout the presentation. There'll be little slides with quotes from people that are far more famous than me, and uh, they've had useful thoughts on the game. I'm sure you all, if not all of them, certainly most of you will know who Johan Cruyff is. Uh, he says, play football with your head. You know, your legs are there to help you. So it's, it's a cognitive game that we play. I think that gets underestimated sometimes. Uh, 
it's, it's got huge physical and technical demands, of course, uh, but it's a cognitive game that we play, but you need everything. So although I'll talk about scanning and those, because that's my passion, scanning is nothing if you don't have technical ability, you know, and as we go into it, technical ability opens up the, the usefulness of what you see out there in the field anyway. But first of all, I think it's important to look at, you know, decision making and, and what we think decision making is uh, and see where the scanning awareness fits within decision making. Um, a lot of people, a basic model, people would see it as a linear process uh, where you look, then you make a decision and then you make an action, sometimes seen as, uh, you know, the input, the process and then the output or perception, decision, action, however, whatever terms that you want to use. use. I use see, think, play. Uh, we'll use that on the next slide. Um, and some people think it's a linear process and there are many models out there. You could look at uh, Gary Klein's work, which is fantastic on decision-making. Uh, there's John Boyd Zudaloop, which, you know, stood the test of time, a 50, 60 year old model. Uh, which is fantastic, or you could look at something that's been de developed more currently by Lenz Ikovsky and uh, um, Dan uh, with their books, The Playmaker's Advantage and The Playmaker's Decisions. You can go and have a look at them to get more info on, on decision making. It's a really important topic in the game. But th this is how we often think of it, and this is how we think players are going to act, that, that, that they'll look around so they can make a decision, an informed decision, then they'll commit to an action. Unfortunately, what we find is that the vast majority of players out there, what they tend to do is they control the ball. Then they have a look to, to see what's out there, to see what then decision they'll make and then commit to an action. Um, and unfortunately, what, what happens tends to happen in the game is that, that players largely focus on the ball throughout the game. They watch the ball wherever it goes. Then they control the ball, they watch it into their feet, then they lift their head to try and make a decision and commit to an action. And that's all too slow and late and kind of in the wrong order. When we talk about see, think, play, or look, decision, action, perception, decision, act, whatever we're on about, we often assume that players are looking around to gather in information to inform their decision making when they get the ball. Unfortunately, the vast majority of players don't behave that way when they're on the field. Now, they'll know the correct answer, they'll tell you the correct answer, but judge players on their behaviours, not the verbal answers that they give you. So if, if we think about it, there's my terminology, see, think, play. Okay, um, I don't really think it's a linear process. Uh, it's, it's more of this cycle of interactive elements. And again, you could look at other models and you'll see how they put it and where they have feedback loops, etc. So, but I, I use this as a, a nice, uh, simple uh, model of interactive elements where they influence each other, uh, nothing separate, you know. So your, your actual, what you see is going to affect how you play, but how you play, your, your technical ability is going to limit what you're capable of seeing in the first place. So, you know, they really interact with each other. So the, the greater repertoire of technical skills that, that a player has, the more options they will see when they're out on the field of play, which gives them the opportunity to potentially make more effective decisions during gameplay. And I'm not going to go into these because th this isn't what this presentation is necessarily about, the decision-making side of things, but I break down the referencing into Three, there's more than these. I highlight three key points when, when I talk these signal situation scenarios. Signals is body cues. Situations is what a player sees and interprets. And scenarios, scenarios are more things like um, a game plan, you know, a pattern of play that, that a team works on to try and execute during the course of play. Um, so there's a subtle difference between situations and scenarios. Uh, then in the framing side of things, we've got ta tactics, tendencies, technical components, and then in the localizing, there's prospect and perspective and priming. And I go into them in more detail, slightly more detail in the book, but we're not here to go on about decision making. What we're actually looking at is this component here, whatever model that you want to look at, whether you want to call it C, whether you want to call it look, whether you want to call it input, whether you want to call it perception, this is what we're talking about here. Um, and the awareness element that directly impacts on decision making and therefore the scanning that's important to feed that awareness. Um, 
Another guy here with a fantastic haircut. I love it. And uh, more knowledge of the football than me about the game, obviously. Uh, but and, and he says, taking the right decision in the right moment, that's the most difficult thing in football. And I think one of the contributing factors to that is simply because the, the players don't have sufficient awareness of what's going on around them. And that's because they don't scan frequently enough. And again, there are other elements that can feed into the scanning. We'll come on to that later in the presentation. But fundamentally, players don't look around enough. They'll say that they do. They think that they do. But in, in actual fact, they don't. So awareness, um, what we're talking about, I, I kind of, there was no real model of game awareness or a decent definition of what game awareness was. You know, we, we talk about game awareness, but it's poorly defined and there are debates on what it is and what it isn't, et cetera. So there was nothing there for football. So I looked outside football and I found a, a model for situation awareness by Mike Ensley, who used to be the chief scientist for the US Air Force. She developed this model, uh, you know, decades ago uh, for situation awareness and had a simple-ish three level model uh, where she has level one being perception of elements in the current situation, level two being the comprehension of the current situation and level three being projection of future status. And so I lent on that heavily and, and she was very good to me. Uh, you know, we, we chatted a lot, corresponded a lot. She, she helped guide me in my thoughts on this kind of thing in, in football. Um, so, but the thing that I highlight here is that this um, quote from, from a paper, level two goes beyond being aware of the elements that are present to include an understanding of the significance of those elements in light of pertinent operator goals. And I think that's important because when we often talk about game awareness and scanning, I end up getting into the debate with coaches and it's a good debate, I'm not dismissing it. And I think it's not just about looking about, it's what they're looking at and how they perceive it. And I'm like, yep, you're completely correct. I 100% agree with you. But that comes at level two. The understanding, putting the pieces together comes at level two. Level one is just about accessing the information in the first place. And too often we try to skip straight to level two with it equipping the players with the basic fundamentals of just taking their eyes off the ball and looking around the play. So I, th I think that's important. And it's also important for me to say here, whilst uh, I say level one, level two, level three, again, like the decision-making model, it's not like these are discrete elements that work in isolation. They work with each other, you know? So, but it's useful to, to try and define the, these elements uh, on an individual basis. So level one, uh, observation, really it's active scanning of the playing area and panoramic positioning. And I'll come on to another slide in a second to go through each of these. So level two is realizing what I call realization, uh, reading the game and adaptive positioning. And level three is anticipation, uh, which predicting how the play is likely to develop and prospective positioning. I'll give a bit more detail on those now. So in the book, we illustrate the model like this, uh, just level one, level two, level three. And again, I'd like to emphasize much as we're going to talk about these as if they are isolated elements, but they're not, they're linked in the impact on each other. Um, and that they're more nested elements than, than isolated elements. So level one, uh, and again, I'll use this, it's the lowest level of awareness. It's only about access and information. It's about taking your eyes off the ball, looking around to be able to access the information, get the information into your body, into your mind, into your brain. Um, you're looking to, can you locate the ball, teammates and opponents in space? Okay, that kind of thing, because fundamentally that's what you're going to base your decisions on. So do you know where they are? And, and here at level one, I'm just trying to create the habits of players looking around all the time when they can on a consistent and continuous basis, because it's an essential skill. And it is a skill and it can be developed and it can be nurtured, but off too often we take it for granted and just throw in phrases like check your shoulder, you know, um, with it, thinking that that's coaching. But then if just telling a player what to do and not creating the environment to develop these habits was sufficient, then we would just tell players to go and score goals. You know, it'd be that simple. That's all a coach's job would be. Go and score goals. Don't let the opposition score goals. That's it. That's all the coaching you need to do. 
actually we all know it's a bit more complicated than that. And then what I call panoramic position. So what Ensley's model didn't have was this, um, this positioning element, this physical element. Now, much as she didn't, obviously in her model, there was an assumption that, that, that the operators would move to access information. So her model was, was designed for aviation, for which was uh, the US Air Force, uh, that designed, uh, designed for pilots, air traffic controllers, who largely have these, the visual displays in front of them, you know, because they're designed that way. So th there's less physical movement required by one of those operators than what we think in the game. And all, as I say, although she, it's not like she said that, or she would certainly assume that operators would, would move to access information as required because of the nature of our game in the 360 degree environment they have, I thought it was important to include this as an explicit element within the model. So panoramic position at this stage, it's just about getting players to open up and see as much of the field as possible so they can maximize the field of view. Pure and simple as that. At any occasion, can you maximize your field of view to see as much of the field as possible? Um, and too often we find that even at the basic level, players close off too much of the playing area. They come square to the ball, they come whatever exercise, they come square to the ball so they can't even have a quick look what's behind them. It makes it harder. So panoramic position is at level one. Level two, realization. This is where they recognize patterns. They understand the tactical perspective of what's going on. They can start push, put, they put the pieces of the puzzle together and understand what's going on in the here and now. They're able to prioritize between the ball teammates, opponents, and, and space. And again, it's creating habits to continually manage the space and adjust to the to suit the changing circumstances as things are moving because the game's fluid, it's always on the move. You know, what happens now is going to be very different to what's happening in one second's time, never mind five seconds' time. And then I talk about this level, adaptive positioning. So that's about whereas level one is just being uh, um, open to as much of the field of play as possible to maximize your field of view. You're now positioning yourself in relation to who you've identified as your key elements out there. So the key teammates, the key opponents, where the ball is. So you've positioned yourself accordingly. If the ball's over there, you're maybe going to be open this way. So adaptive positioning is hugely important. Level three, anticipation. I'm sure we all know what that, that means. You know, it's predicting how the play is going to develop. So it builds on these, incorporates these previous elements. Um, but the important thing is, and the way I work, what I'm looking at is quick, getting the players to quickly recognize signals and situations from the briefest of windows. So the, the best players in the world not only have the capability of seeing more, so they scan more, so they see more, they're able to do it in less time from the briefest of glimpses. So that's important as well. And then the positioning element I talk about here is prospective positioning. So that's where a player readies themselves for what's going to happen next. Now, these aren't game actions, but I'm maybe providing cover here, and I can see that the opponents are probably going to switch over there. So what I do is I loosen off my, my closeness to this teammate because I'm anticipating that switch. I don't completely detach because I'm maybe still going to be required here because the opponents might not do what I'm expecting them to but I'm starting to loosen that off and ready myself for my next game action of going to provide cover over there. So that's the perspective positioning element. Um, again, you'll have your own terminology. This is my terminology. I, I don't say that people need to use this terminology. This is just how I've thought about the game. If you find that you've got a term that works for you and your players and any of these elements, that's the important communications about, can you get your message that the players understand and if you have, a, it could be apples. You could say apples and they understand that means prospective positioning. That's fine. Um, there's a guy, had a fairly decent career, you would think. And um, uh, now the, the manager at, at Barcelona, uh, head coach at Barcelona. And this was something that, a topic that he was passionate about. He was right up at the top of the tree, the best player in the world at this, you know, one of my favorite players at all time. And he continually talks about this, you know, and again, if somebody like him, uh, is going to continually talk about this. I think we should pay attention to it and find out how we can help our players be better. This is uh, my, my A to F performance cycle. I'm not going to go label this too much. A to F, because I use the letters A to F, 
you know, it works in English, other language was, wouldn't quite work so well. Um, but the but what I'm asking here is A is for active scan is just can the players have a look? Can they look around on uh, away from the ball on a consistent and continuous basis? Body position, um, adopting that. Can they get the body position right? There's two components to that orientation, right? So body shape and location on the field, where you are and the position in the field in relation to other things around you. Check again, the C, check again, um, or confirm. Um, so that's, can you have one last look, even as the ball is on its way to you? Um, can you have that final check just to confirm the game picture and what you're going to do? Or it might be a final check just to check where pressure is, etc. But can you have that one last look away from the ball as it's coming into you? Um, D is for decision. So can you think quickly? Um, what I like to to clarify uh, for me is that the quality of the decision um, should be evaluated independently from the execution of the game action. Um, so a player can make a great decision, they just don't execute it quite well. And what I found as a, uh, as a coach educator, um, well, I would be in sessions, I would see that a player's made a good decision to, to, to maybe find a pass that was forward and it could have been, it was on, they just didn't execute it very well and then the coaches come in and said okay look at that that didn't quite work it look you've got a simple little pass here just play that one and i'm thinking well actually the decision was right it was just the technical component that was wrong so the, the coaches went in and coached the decision as opposed to what maybe should have been coached so i think we need to understand you know was the decision right and was it the execution that let them down so was it a good decision so look at that then we, we can think about execution did they execute it well? And again, that should be, to me, should be evaluated independently from the decision making. To, so reinforce that because a player could execute a great pass. So that same scenario, execute this little six yard pass here excellently well and would maintain possession. But really in the right moment, was that the best decision? Yeah, we kept possession, but there was maybe a forward pass that was available that could have broke a line, that could have caused, caused problems to the opponents, but we didn't choose that one. So they've executed an excellent six-yard pass, but could we have went there? Could the decision be better? So that, that's where I am with that. And then the S is the, the follow-on. And I think this is really important, and it could happen really anywhere in this cycle. But the follow-on, what do the players do next? Because what you often see is the gallery players, you know, they receive the ball, then they play the pass, and it's brilliant. And then they just stand there and watch. And they're like going, it's a brilliant pass, that, isn't it? Like, coach, you need to pick me every week. Look, look, look at that pass. When actually, they should be thinking, what's next? What's next? So how quickly do the players re-engage? And obviously, you can see this cycle is largely based around players receiving the ball. But you can adapt this cycle to, to off-the-ball performance as well. Because actually, the vast majority of the game is played off the ball. Quick thing here. Um, Chris Callan did a, a study into uh, time and the, the study was, was in French uh, League One in, in France. And it looked at how long players were in possession and various other things came out in the study. I think it's quite surprising. Again, you could look at other studies, other things, and the numbers might be slightly different, but they won't be far off this. The average, average time in possession. So some players had more, some players would maybe have had less. Average time in possession in a 90-minute game was a grand total of 53.4 seconds. That was how long the player was actually on the ball, physically had control of the ball. Okay? Um, so quite staggering, really. And again, you could look at different st studies, you might get slightly different numbers, but they won't be far away from this. Okay, uh, the number of possessions, so the number of times the individual player got on the ball as an average was just under 47 times. So in a game, you could expect to get the ball 47 times out of 90 minutes of play. The average time in per possession, again, in this study, caveat within this study, was 1.1 seconds. So you physically had the ball on average for 1.1 seconds every time you had it, right? And the average touches per possession was two. So you only got on the ball 47 times, you only had 1.1 seconds with the ball, and you only had 
on average two touches with the ball. So I would say being able to make good decisions before you've even got the ball, whilst you're off the ball, is incredibly important for to impact on what you can do with the ball. And that comes down to the more scanning you do, the more informed you are, the more awareness you have, the better decisions you can make, the better prepared you are for each and every interaction that you do have with the ball, and you can be as effective as possible in those brief moments that you have it. This is just a highlight from my little cycle there, just saying 89 minutes off the ball. And again, the numbers might be two to three percent of the game, you're going to be off the ball. And just to say that thin slither there is what's done on the ball, the execution element. Everything else should be getting done off the ball. Everything else should be getting done off the ball all the time. Okay. Little video here. I'm sure maybe some of you will have seen this. It's very popular now that this was part of Gear Jordet's study. I'll mention him again. Gear's a good friend of mine and done amazing research in this. If you haven't read it, please go out there, look it up, go and read it. Fantastic stuff about scanning and how important it is. And he, this was one of the, the resources he used when he was doing his uh, study in the English Premier League back in 2013. The paper was published in 2013. And this is Frank Lampard. So just watch this. If you haven't seen it before, please watch it. Look how many times Frank Lampard looks around him in this little passage of play. So, um, uh, if anybody wants to type and answer what they think, how many times Frank had a look around, and I'll give you 10 seconds, then I'll tell you that, the exact answer. I'm getting a few people on the chat there. That's good. Uh, eight from Romero, 14 for Jacob, 10 from Nigel. So you can see even how we perceive and look at something amongst us coaches watching the same film. We're coming with a few different answers. Tom's put 12. Great. Okay, we're about 10 seconds there. So the official answer from me is a lot. Okay, <laughs> right, it's a lot. And I think more than most. And, and when, when the study was done in the English Premier League, Frank Lampard was the top player when it came to scanning frequency, visual exploratory behavior, as it was termed back then. However, we wanted them looking around. Okay, looking around. He was the top player. And he looks around a lot. You know, and, you know, he had a very successful career. Uh, but I remember having a, de uh, a debate, discussion, you know, a, a debate, a good sense of the word, um, with uh, a coach involved with a national team programme, and we're talking about this. And he, when we're talking about scanning and Frank Lampard, and his actual words were to me, you know, Kev, I think Frank Lampard actually looks around too much so that's what he said to me and and everybody's entitled to their opinion but what i'm thinking in my head then is yeah let, let's go and tell frank lampard you know what you could have had a better career if you didn't look around quite so much you wouldn't have scored so many goals uh, you would have scored more goals and and you would have won more trophies if you if you didn't look around quite so much i don't really think that fits personally but again everybody's entitled to their opinion um, oops, my presentation seems to have stopped. Yeah, there we go. So the, this was the study by Gilles Jordet that, that came out um, 2013. And again, there's, there's some different numbers that get attributed in different places, but this is, these are the numbers that the gear frequently puts out when he talks about um, people, player scanning. We're on about players in the English Premier League here, remember. So what Gear measured was how often players looked around. And what he found was they kind of fell into three groups. You had the high frequency scanners, you had the low frequency scanners, and then you had the group in between. So what he did was compare and contrast the players that looked around a lot compared to those that looked around not so much in relative terms in the English Premier League. And what he tried to do is how, how does the, this, is there a anything that we could measure. So you looked at past completion rates of forward passes, okay, of the players. And what he found between the two groups, the, the high and the low, was that the high frequency players completed, successfully completed 77% of the forward passes. 
Okay, so they completed almost eight out of 10 of their forward passes. The low frequency group completed only 39% of their forward passes. Okay, so um, less than, than four out of 10 successful passes. Now, these are English Premier League players that we're on, but these are good players, right? So again, it's not looking at this and saying, oh, you're bad, it's looking at, yep, these are good players. And as coaches, we need to think, okay, how can we help you add something to your game that, that will potentially get you closer to that 77%, potentially help you become a better player, more effective? Because these players on the left are retaining possession and creating opportunities for the, the team almost eight times out of 10. And these players on the right are giving the ball away to the opposition over six times out of 10. Who do you want in your team? Or as coaches, who would we like to develop for the future game? And so again, Scanning uh, is what they looked at here. And as Gear acknowledges and I acknowledge, we're not saying scanning is everything. It's one small part, but it's a significant part. It's an important part of what a player um, needs to be able to do. Here's just a few of the things. As I said, uh, Lampard was at uh, what's called 0.62 scans per second. So in the 10 seconds prior to him receiving the ball, he looked around away from the ball just over six times on average in that 10 seconds prior to receive it. Steven Gerrard was just below him. They were the two highest in that, that study at that time. Um, Xavi, um, who we talked about before, he's on record as having 0.83 scans. And so he's the highest that, that Gears ever measured. Uh, he's right at the top of the tree. So in the 10 seconds prior to him receiving the ball, he looked around eight times. Just imagine that, you know, how quick that is. You know, that, that's, that's like going, a metronome going, beep, 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 beep. That's how often he's looking around that 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. Uh, Fabregas is actually quite up there in some of the studies that have been done. And then other players, like Messi, Iniesta, Pilo, Ibrahimovic. Then you've got, you got uh, the player, Haaland, Mbappe, et cetera, uh, Odegaard. Now, they're way high there. Anything over 0 0.5 seconds is considered high frequency high frequency, 0 0.5 scans per second. So five times in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball would be considered high. Just to emphasize this, because I don't think it could be emphasized enough. Again, you've probably seen this video. Just look how often he, he looks around. And then what I always say to players, whether I'm working with them at professional level, and that's it. You say you look around, do you really think you look around like that? There's a top professional. So he's the highest. He was the highest in the Premier English Premier League study. So your average player and your development players are not doing this. And that's not to say that they're going to do it overnight, but can we help them over time get to this? This is a little clip. I'm going to compare and contrast two players well. I was coaching at Dundee United. This was a game towards the end of the season. So we're just going to compare and contrast two players. We're going to look at the centre midfielder here. And you'll see that he's scanning is not in the Frank Lampard range, but this is just to show he looks away from the ball. So we're going to look at this centre midfielder and look at him looking away from the ball. Uh, you see, passes, looks away from the ball. Ball's on the way to him, he looks away again. Passes again, looks up the field again. Okay, so now he has a real look inside to see where other players are. Now, I'm not saying that he's perfect, but you can see that he looks away from the ball. And we assume that all professional players do this. Granted, this was the Scottish Premier League, um, but good players that are in here, good professionals uh, at that level. And let's compare and contrast the centre midfielder with the full back, the left back, that he interchanges the passes with. Okay? So there's the centre midfielder. Right, there's the fullback. Fullback's only looking at the ball. The ball's on its way now. Fullback is only looking at the ball. The centre midfielder is looking up the field. Fullback is still only looking at the ball. Centre midfielder looking up the field. Fullback is still only looking at the ball. Still only looking at the ball. Ball going back. Centre midfielder looking up the field. Fullback still only looking at the ball. Finally, he looks up the field. All right. So you can see, much as we expect, professional players do this, you can see that they're not always doing it and are they doing it at the right time, etc. And that's not to say, again, 
that that left back was a bad player. That left back was a good player. So as a coach, I'm just looking at it and going, okay, how can I help you add something to your game that will help you be better? You know, help you be more effective for us. Because in that passage of play, there were maybe opportunities that he could have played the ball forward earlier. But because he never looked, he never knew. He couldn't make a decision on that. You cannot make a decision on things you don't know about. There's actually a technical term for a player that makes decisions based on things they don't know about. It's called a guess. Okay? It's a guess, right? So do you want players to make informed decisions or do you want them to guess? Uh, I would prefer players to make informed decisions. Little quote from Thierry Henry. Thought he was a fabulous player. He's right up there with one of my favourite players of all time. And again, on a few occasions when he's been interviewed and he's gotten to this topic, he's talked about it. And this was before you hear every, you seem to hear everybody talking about it now when they're analysing games, talking about awareness, talking about scanning. And it's become increasingly the in vogue thing to talk about. But you know, Gear has been researching this for. 20 years. I've been involved in coaching this for, for 15 to 20 years. So, you know, it, and and I'm not saying I was the only one that ever started coaching scanning. I mean, there was coaches before me that probably did stuff. There will be coaches that I didn't know about that did stuff. Um, back when the early days when I was coaching, there wasn't the internet. So, you know, there wasn't the same resources or knowledge sharing about. So um, that was limited. Right. Um, important thing, uh, key moments for active scanning. Here's five key moments that you could identify to encourage players for active scanning. Bear in mind, we are talking about level one observation. We're not talking about understanding, knowledge, et cetera. We're talking about just scanning, just looking around. First key moment, as the ball is traveling when receiving a pass. Here's one, one that we could identify. Okay, can you do it as late as possible, as early as needed? So if Paul's got the ball and he's passing it to me, Paul passes it, and as the ball is traveling, and before I take my first touch, I'll look away somewhere else in the plane area to gather information. Important thing being is that shouldn't be your first scan. That is your last scan. And some, some of the great players can actually scan two or three times in that moment, okay, whether it's to the same area or a different area, you know, there, there, and there again. Um, that should, that's your last scan or your last moment to scan. You should have done pre-scan before that, and they will link in. As the ball is traveling after the pass, as early as possible, as late as needed. So when a player has the ball and they pass the ball, okay, again, can they look away? Can they look away to some other information in the area that's going to help them make a decision now on what am I going to do now? Where am I going to move now? Am I going to move in advance to support the goal at the ball? Am I going to drop off, et cetera? So as early as possible, as, as late as needed. And with these two things, it's important with the first one, you're looking as the ball is traveling. Not as the ball is being touched, but as the ball is traveling. And the same with the pass after the ball, right? You shouldn't really be looking as your foot's connecting with the ball, okay? Now, as, as when the ball's traveling towards you, the reason that you're looking after the pass is played is because you need to pick up the information in the ball first. You know, what's the direction and the pace of the pass? You know, is it coming to the left a little bit? Is it coming to the right a little bit? Is it coming straight to you? And if you know that, actually, you can adjust your feet why were you having a look? So you're in line to control the ball. Okay. So it's important you pick up that information first. And it's the same way after you've passed the ball, you want to see, have I passed it right? Is the outcome going to be what I want? But the higher the level of player, actually, they can tend to do that less with the visual information and more with the feel, the feedback that they get through their body from the connection with the ball. They're able to know, you know what, didn't he pass that quite right? I put my teammate in a bit of trouble. How's that going to pan out? I might need to look there a bit more. Okay. Um, as the ball is traveling between two players, so teammates or opponents, you aren't involved with the ball now. You, are, you could be close to the ball. You could be far away from the ball. Okay. But as it's traveling between two players, so Paul has passed the ball to Tom. As that ball is traveling from Paul to Tom, I'm having a look somewhere else. And again, if I've been scanning regular, I know where I'm going to direct those looks. Because when you're looking, you're starting to gather information. That's important to me. That's important to me. Now you see that. I'm going to look here because that's the most important bit for me to look at just now. And that's where I say everything becomes connected. Um, so as that ball is traveling, nothing's going to happen with the ball. It's, it's dead time almost. Make use of it. Look. Because as, as the ball moves, players move, the pictures changes. You've got to have a look. 
in between touches when a player is moving with the ball. So that might be a player is moving just across the different, like the centre back moving across the defensive line a little bit, taking a few little touches uh, at, at his or her feet, unopposed. Generally, they've got time. So anytime they take a touch at their feet, you have a little look away. Where's pressure coming from? Where's my teammate if I get the ball? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, it could be when a player is running with the ball. And running with the ball is different from dribbling with the ball. Well, running with the ball is when you're trying to exploit open space at pace with the ball. So you tend to take large touches at your feet to move quickly and exploit space quickly. So as that touch goes out of their feet, can you think of it? Quick look away, update your picture, okay? The chances are you, you're not going to really look away in between dribbling touches. Dribbling touches are for close control to beat an opponent normally. So you, you're really only going to be able to do that. So I've, I've highlighted the uh, more detail about that. And as a player takes a controlling touch, now this is a difficult one. This, this, this comes with more experience. This is the player that's receiving the ball. You can tell they're going to use two touches. So as they take a controlling touch, that might be, Okay, an opportunity to go quick update. I'll have another quick update because they're definitely going to take two touches. But you need to be experienced and be able to judge the body cues of the players to know they're going to take two touches. Because if they're receiving it and playing a one touch pass, you really want to be looking at them as they're connecting the ball. So, and again, that could be teammate or opponent. Thing. More thoughts on how a player scans, just to put a bit more detail here. Players must be able to scan left and right. So they should be able to scan over the left shoulder and the right shoulder. And that seems simple, but you'll actually find players that will try, and particularly if you put them in environments, you'll see them predominantly check over one shoulder. And if you were to sit there just now, even just moving your head over one shoulder or the other, you'll probably find one slightly more comfortable than the other, right? That, for me, is, is easier than, than this one looking over my left. But you can train to be better. So they need to be good at scanning both left and right. They need to be able to scan horizontally and vertically on the field. So that's across the field and up and down the field. Okay, so they need to be able to scan that as well. So can they scan left and right? Can they scan horizontally? Can they scan vertically on the field of play? And can they scan at the right times? And we've just highlighted some of the right times there that a player could scan and scan on a regular basis. But also scanning. The scanning demands can be position specific in the game. And, and some of the data has found that, you know, that, that how a left back has to scan is different from a striker. Uh, it's different from the right back. It's different from the right midfielder. It's different from the, the number 10. It's different from the number six. Yeah, and that would seem obvious. And I get that scanning demands can be position specific. And you do get people say, well, you know, so we should train them in those position specific things. That sounds great when you're at the first team professional level, helping them with their positions. But at what point do we know that the, somebody is going to be a striker? Do you know a nine-year-old is going to be a striker or a central defender or a midfielder? So my view is, you know, if we are coaching them at a young age, we should help them be 360 degrees, right? And then when it comes to identifying where the position is and they find that and they settle into that, because they've been 360 degrees, they can now fit in easily a scanning pattern at left back or at right back, and they can adapt it accordingly. Also, scanning demands can be team specific. So how you choose to play as a team, how a player needs to scan within that will be different. So someone that plays, a team that plays 4-4-2, you know, with four defenders that never cross the, the halfway line, will have play, scanning demands that are different from a team that plays 3-5-2 and tells the fullbacks, or the wing backs just to bomb on at every opportunity. So the scanning demands will be team specific. The kids, uh, and also with that, sorry, going back to that. So that's quite important because the scanning demands, if you are at the top level of the football, football and you're playing club football, the scanning demands that you're going to have are going to be different potentially at your club to your international team. So you play at the weekend for your club, then you go and play for your international team. The scanning demands are maybe different because of how they play and exactly how you're asked to play in that role, okay? And then it could be game specific because you'll maybe have a specific game plan for certain opposition, but you're up against a different group of players and they have their own tendencies and tactics, et cetera. So the way that you're going to scan 
is going to be affected potentially by the opponents that you're up against. So where you're going to need to look and how you're going to need to look can be affected slightly in those moments. So as opposed to saying uh, it's only completely position specific, let's equip our players to be 360 degrees, because even when the studies have shown strikers scan the fewest, you've got Mbappe and Haaland that are right up there. Mbappe is, you know, not quite at the Xavi, uh, the, the Xavi level, but he's getting up towards there. You know, more at the Lampard level than your regular strikers. So you can't just say it's, it's okay for strikers to scan less. You know, every player is different as well. Can we give, uh, fill their toolbox with as much as possible? Some great, I'll show through video, a few videos here. Some great resources now on the internet about this. Uh, Slavik uh, Moravsky, I think I've got his name out, hopefully. Mind Footballness. He's got a great Twitter feed. Um, go and look at the videos he puts up. Does a great job at highlighting how often players scan. Um, so look at that. I'll show you this clip. So highlighting De Bruyne, how often he's looking away. Look, how often he scans away, even as the ball is traveling as well to him, um, to create opportunities. This other thing, so we'll flip between the two. Be your best. Uh, this is a, a, um, a company that, that Gear's involved in and it does virtual reality training to, to, to help scan. Uh, does some great work. They post on their website and on their Twitter feed some great videos to highlight scanning. So you can have uh, a look at this as well. That's uh, Frankie de Jong, I think that is. Um, again, how often he looks and when he looks. Even as the ball's on its way, he has one last look. Absolutely brilliant. So there he's had a look up the field. As the ball's on its way, he's looking again. So... Again, exactly what they're taking in there, position the teammates or position opponents or perception of space, you know, we could discuss. But they look away frequently and even as the ball has come. Billy Gilmore, oh, sorry. This one, Billy Gilmore, Scottish, so I need to throw him in there. Um, you know, keep the Scottish end up as it were. But, uh, oops, fantastic young player. Again, watch him, has a look away. Even as the ball is coming, has another look to inform his decision making of what he's going to do with the ball. So he's understanding how much pressure, where he's got space, what he can do with the ball, potentially where he's going to pass. And again, these are just looking at the last little episode with the ball. I think that's the last one. A little bit of Xabi Alonso, because he was decent at it as well. Another, another player with a decent career. Just look at how often he, he looks around. And again, I'm not going to labour this too much, uh, but the videos are out there. Look at Sla there's Slavic's name, it's Slavic Marasky. And he's also got at mind footballness. It's a, go and look at those Twitter feeds. Fabulous resources to, to get more info on this and, and see good videos that, that these people have put together on this. Wenger talks about this. He talked about this at the Sports um, Innovation Summit. And he mentions it in his autobiography as well. Actually, the, the little numbers are different between the Innovation Summit and the, the autobiography, but you get the idea. Um, he looked at that. He got gear to do a, you know, a long season-long study at Arsenal because he felt this was so important and again the study even there found that there was you know scanning was important so we have got to it's important to develop exercises that help increase his ability to gather information okay I'm going to reinforce that um, it's important to develop exercises that help increase this ability to gather information and this is important because this is something that I very much believe. Players develop as the environment demands development. So again, the training environment that we put on is how the players will develop. You know, if we have an environment that allows them just not to look at the ball and allows them just to kick the ball away, that's what they'll do. If we have a development environment, as, as Tom often shares, that encourages the players to keep the ball and maintain possession of the ball and be excellent with the ball, then they're more likely to do that. If we encourage a development environment that demands that the players look a bit more, that scan more, that's the behaviours that they'll develop, okay? So there was actually a study done into the scan frequency in games and, and compared to training practice. And this was a study in Holland, so they found in the competitors, so six, six players, top Dutch league players, that they looked at the average scans per second that they required in that 10 seconds before receiving the ball was 0.44. So they looked over, looked around, 
just over four times in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball in the game. But when you look at the exercises that the players doing that we as coaches regularly use um, with our players, small-sided games, the players only looked around 0.36 times. So um, less than four times in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. In the possession games, they only looked around 0.22 times. Okay, So half the amount of times than they did in the games, in the actual game itself. Passing and receiving drills, so your, your drill A passes to B, B passes to C. Players only looked around 0.12 times in the 10 seconds. So they looked around just once, just over once on average in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. Now, that's because in a practice, uh, uh, a drill, they already know where the pass is going next. They already know where the player is going next. So they don't need to look around. So they don't. So the environment hasn't really demanded that they look around. So therefore, they don't. And then rondos. Only players looked around, scanned away from the ball on average 0 0.03 times per second. So less than once in the 10 seconds any time that they received the ball. Okay. So think about that. Again, it's a rondo. We all, most of us use rondos in one format or another, you know, whatever guys that, that we kind, kind of use. Now, the important thing here with this study and, and is that is this to say that these exercise formats are bad? No, they're good. They're great. I use them. I'm sure you, uh, all the you coaches there use various of these for the small-sided games, possession games, drills, or rondos. So it's not saying these exercises are bad, it's just to raise awareness that in this study it's highlighted that actually the demands of the exercise when it comes to scanning are not the same as the game. So we need to be aware of that. And then also we, we go, if we want our exercise to replicate the demands of the games or help prepare the players for the demands of the game, if we're going to use these exercises, is there some way of adapting them to encourage more scanning? So they're forced to scan more frequently and closer or more than they are required to do in the game. So again, it's not to say don't use these exercises. It's just to say, okay, if we use them and we want to replicate the scanning element of the game, what do we need to do to adapt these exercises? So we'll look at a few of these. Um, what I talk about is drills. Uh, dynamic exercises and opposed practices. Drills are your ba basic A passes to B, B passes to C, depending how many players on. It might be a follow your pass. It might just be one player working in the middle that we've got here, right? But the, the point is it's a drill. And although I don't use drills that often nowadays compared to when I was younger and in my early coaching career, I, I used drills. I still think they're an important part of any coach's toolkit as long as you understand why you're using them, what you're using them for. And again, if you're going to use them, is there a way to, we can adapt them to increase this element of scanning? So here, we've got a basic drill. We've got a player receiving a pass in the middle and passing it back. And I've seen this in countless places, even seen it in there was a study visit by the Irish FA to Norway, and they were looking at their elite players, their national team, youth national teams, and their youth national team was doing this exact drill, but with the, the bits that I had in. OK, so people use drills like this. I'm not going to say coaches never use drills. Look, if that's the format that you use to work with your players and you're comfortable with, OK, let's look at the drill. And let's see how we can adapt it to increase the amount of scanning, to increase the demands on the player. And with this, you just put a couple of cones in their hand, put a couple of gloves on, wristbands, whatever it is, just one hand, two hand. There's various ways that you can get it just to get the players to look over their shoulder to get them thinking about looking away from the ball. So here's a picture to highlight it, slightly different format, but same thing with two players, one at each end and one player working in the middle. And the point I'm highlighting here, this player is holding up a cone. Here we've got a red cone getting held up for the player, the working player to spot. And you can see that he's looking there to spot and call it the color, oops, even as the ball is on its way to him. So, and that's what I always encourage the players to do in my exercises. Can you have that look as the ball, after the pass and before your first touch? So as the ball is on its way, can you have that look to identify the colour? Now, I'm not saying, again, to re-emphasise, that's not necessarily the first look. So in, whether it's a drill, a dynamic exercise, or a post-practice, if players are having early looks, they are great, encourage them. 
but always try and encourage them, if they can, have that last look, even as the ball is on its way. Sometimes they might just not have the time because of pressure, pace of pass, whatever the distance, we get that. But can that be a habit for them? So that's a drill. A dynamic exercise would be an unopposed exercise, but in a playing area that players are free to move around. Okay, they're free to move around, so there's slightly more chaos there, but there is no opposition. Okay, it's an unopposed exercise. So here, these are, these are actually micro sessions, so this wouldn't be the dimensions that were used, but just so you can see it, what we've got is we've got eight players um, uh, in the playing area, sorry, uh, should be eight players or six players in the playing area. We've got players in green, players in blue. Simple thing, passed in opposite color. Okay. So, oops, greens pass to blues, blues pass to greens. However, in this, whenever you're receiving a pass, you must spot and call the colour getting held up by the teammate on the outside. What you can see is we've got two players on the outside, one here, one here, and they are constantly on the move around the area. And as you receive the ball, if you're in green, you must spot and call the colour getting held up by the green player on the outside. If you're in blue, you must spot and call the colour getting held up by the blue player on the outside. Okay, as the ball is coming towards you. Oops. So you can see it, it's moving about. Yep, we've got four greens in there, four blues, one was hidden. Again, this is a micro session. It was just that's all we could fit in decently at the, at the camera angle to to illustrate how the session runs, you would then use it in a bigger area, depending on the size of group and the, the players that you've got. But the players there were having that last scan as the ball was on its way to them to see where the teammate was on the outside. And I've just, uh, this is a different picture. We've varied it slightly here, where now what we've got, it's, it's a red player and a yellow player on the outside as opposed to green and blue, because I've got a yellow ball and a red ball. So you still pass an opposite colour in here, but the demands are increased because when you're receiving the red football, you spot the red player on the outside and call it the colour. When you're receiving the yellow football, you spot and call it the colour getting held up by the yellow player. So as you can see, the yellow player is holding up a red cone there. There's the yellow ball. There's the blue player who is receiving the ball and he is looking at where the yellow player is to call it the colour red before his first touch. So I get them to call out that spot and call it that color as the ball is on its way. The important thing here is that is not the first time they've looked to see where the player is. Okay, that's the last look to have a look and confirm the color and call it the color. When you talk to your players, you talk to them, when should you be looking? They ultimately get to that all the time. As you're looking about, can you think, where's the footballs? Where's here? Where's the yellow and red flasher? In the previous thing, you're only thinking about your team color flasher. So you're thinking, where's the footballs? Where's my teammate on the outside? Where's the footballs? Where's the teammate on the outside? The important thing here is, much as I use colors, cones, gloves, it might be one hand, two hand, the colors aren't important. Getting the players to scan is important. And what you're getting here is the players to scan for other players. And that's what they do in the game. They scan for other players. So you've given them what a key reference point you said, Where's that player on the outside? And if it's your teammate and you're in blue in this exercise and it's passed to the opposite color, spot your teammate, you should be going, where's the football? Where's blue? Where's the football? Where's blue? Updating that all the time because then when you're now going to get involved with the ball, you can go, right, I know where my teammate is. I know where I'm going to get the ball from. I can orientate my body correctly from where I'm getting the ball from, from where I'm going to scan. Okay? And that can kind of sig uh, simulate in the game that I'm getting the ball from here. I'm going to pass to there. You now know whether your players will look before they get the ball. And then these, when that last scan happens, you find the players that have done no scanning to locate their teammates beforehand, because as the ball has come to them, they're like that, they're going, oh, where are they? Where are they? That's too late to, to know where players are in the pitch. It's the right time to have your last look, but you should have updated your pitch and know what's going on around you well before that. Here we'll have an opposed practice. And so uh, we've, got, we've got in here 4v2. And again, you could change the numbers to suit yourself, change the dimension to suit yourself. This is just to illustrate the concept. We've got four blues in here. Uh, I think it's four blues against um, two greens. Uh, yeah, two greens. So the four blues are against the two greens. And what we've got is a floater in red and a floater in yellow on the inside. 
We've got a flasher in red and a flasher in yellow on the outside. You maintain position. It's now in a posed practice. You maintain position. The way that the blues score is by getting it to one of the floaters on the inside, the red or the yellow, and getting the ball back again. Doesn't need to come back to the same player, anyone in blue. But to score, the player receiving the pass from the joker must spot and call it the colour getting held up by the correct player on the outside. So if you're receiving from the red player, you spot and call it the colour getting held up by the red player on the outside. If you're receiving from the yellow player, you call it spot and call it the colour getting held up by the yellow player on the outside. So once again, it's important as you're moving around, as the ball moves between two players, can you update where they are on the outside? Because they're always on the move. Then when a, play, a pass is getting played into the red joker, you can see that pass is getting played into there. Players should then be going, definitely, where's the red player on the outside? I need to know where that is because that's how we score. And they could orientate their body accordingly to where they might get the pass from the joker from to where the player is on the outside. And then as the ball comes in, they could have that last little look, quick glance up, red, yellow, whatever colour they're holding up. But we're opposed now, so they can't only focus on that. They need to think about their proximity to opponents or where space etc. So all of these things become important. They're going to need to scan there, but they still need to know this picture as well. Where's time, space, opponents, teammates in here? But where's that? And that simulates the game because we might need to have possession in the tight area in here, but then play the out ball. But if you've never lifted your head to know where the out ball is, you can't play. Okay, you're taking a guess. So you can see this rolling on here. The ball got played into the blue player. There it's into the yellow player. He's passing to a blue player. The blue player scans and calls out yellow. And again, dimensions, number of players, number of opponents. You tweak and adapt them as you see fit. Again, just a, uh, a still to highlight. There's the player, the yellow player on the outside holding up the cone only when his teammate in yellow on the inside receives the ball. And you can see the player, the yellow player with the ball. There's the player he's going to pass to. And the player is going to scan, he's already pre-scanned to see where the player is, and then as the ball comes in, he'll have a last scan to spot and identify the colour. Because I say to the players, those, those flashers on the outside could be tricky. They're holding up yellow just now, they could change it on you to red. Know what it is at that last second if you can. Because in the game, the game picture can change. I could look, I'm looking back at the ball, it's getting passed. That's all changing. That's all moving about just now, it's fluid. So can you have that Update your pitch. Oh, pressure's a bit closer than what it was a second ago. Oh, my teammates open. I could open up and play them. So that's the little things that we're simulating. Um, another exercise here. It's like a rondo, uh, almost. Uh, so we've got four support players on the outside, and we've got a two v one on the inside. Two greens against one red. Simple rule here is uh, the method of scoring. When you pass it out to one of the side players the player on the opposite side must hold up one of the cones, gloves, whatever I've got them in. The player receiving the pass back to score must spot and call it the colour before the first touch. And again, the numbers in here can get adapted. I'm just showing you different formats. So here we go. The pass it out, opposite player holds it up, receiving player spots and calls out the colour. You see they even did that as the ball was on its way. Now, now in this sit uh, micro session, I did ask the defender to go easy, okay? Right, because we're just painting a picture here how you could structure your session. So again, just to show you, look, the ball is with the yellow player at the top and the player on the opposite side is holding up a cone. Look how this player has the body, body orientated, already oh. open, already on oh. the half turn, pretty much. Whereas in a lot of these sessions, without that constraint being added in, I'll guarantee they'll have the body almost square to the player that they're receiving. They're not opened up. They're not thinking forward. Why? Because we've not given them a reason to before. Right? This simple addition of this constraint forces them to think about having a look up the field. So you can see he's already looking. There's a scan before he's even receiving a pass to confirm where that player is. And I, ideally, as the ball's coming in, they have that last scan. Because I don't give them the goal if they don't have the last scan and don't call it the colour as the ball is on its way. I go, you've maintained possession, but you don't get a point. Okay, I try and force that scan in then. And then they've got a decision to make. Have I got time to scan? Or is the opponent now too close to me that I just maintain possession? So again, they've got, they can't just think about 
spotting the colour, they've got to know where the opponents are because they've still got to keep the ball. They've still got to be effective and excellent with the ball. Just a picture of a few places I've been to finish things off there. That's when I was at Dynamo Zagreb. Um, there, let's say Dundee United, there's Ryan Gold, who's at uh, Whitecaps, another picture there, Rum. And when I was at Partick Thistle and other senior professional men's team. Now, the great thing there was Jackie McNamara, who was the manager, very open minded. We did this kind of stuff every session. Whereas some people would fear sticking gloves on the players or doing something different. He was very open minded. He felt he thought it would really help the players. And he, he did an interview to discuss that and explain why in the book and what he saw as the benefits. So he really felt, felt it was beneficial with the players, even at senior first team level, okay? Now, much as we are talking about how can we help players at the developmental level, you can still help and coach players at the professional first team level. Challenge there is a lot of the times you're needing to change bad habits to good habits. That takes longer, okay? Whereas the younger we start with young players at this, you start with a blank slate, blank slate. You're putting the good habits in early. You start developing this as part of the receiving skills. That whenever they receive a ball, they have a look. Okay, as they move around the field, they're looking. So the sooner that we can do it, the younger we can do it, the more that's their default habits. We don't need to change habits at a later age. Book me trying to promote it there. My contact email, Kevin at Happy to chat with anybody about this. Uh, if we ever get on a call, be prepared to be on with me for hours because I can talk and talk and talk, as you've probably seen with me waffling on for the past hour um, incessantly. Uh, big passion of mine, love talking about, happy to talk about with anybody at any time. So please feel free to, to drop me a line. And um, that's it. Well, that's, that's me, you know, just rambled through that with my semi-incoherent thoughts. No, a fantastic uh, presentation, Kevin. Thank you uh, very much. I mean, every time I, I hear you talk, I mean, I've got the book as well and I've been around you, but I, I learned so much. And I mean, if you think about it, I mean, these are things that you're right. I mean, th th this is part of the game that I think is so uncoached that's not mm -hmm. really taught to young players. And as you know, I've got two young boys myself. They're very, very good technical players. Um, so this is something that, just immediately I could any coach could help any player out immediately mm -hmm. um, with it so no thanks a lot this was great and uh, Paul I'm sure you want to maybe jump in and also I'm sure there must be some questions as well Kevin thank you so much I mean I think I mean we've had some amazing presentations and I'm enjoying this as much as any yeah. it, it's it makes you look at uh, coaching differently you know, yes. I mean, the, it's the difference between maybe coaching and developing, right? Yep. You know, and, and yeah. it's more than winning a game on the weekend, but how are you developing the players for the long term? And um, I, I, we couldn't agree more at the Dynamo Academy that the earlier, the better, right? Yeah. Uh, your last point is as far as, you know, break, breaking the bad habit of a professional, right? Uh -huh. yeah. You know, it, it's really, it's amazing to think about, right? But it, it's so yep. true. And then when you show the, the stats of the different levels within the professional game, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's the same thing with soccer starts at home, right? Yep. It's that, that early, 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 those early ages are, are really the most important, you know? Yeah. So, um, wow. It just blew me away. Um, I'm going to watch this multiple times, mm -hmm. share it with our, all our coaching staff. I'll probably share it with all our players as yeah. well. Have all the players watch it. You know, because yeah. uh, I think it's it's that important, you know, so um, <laughs> no, thank you so much. Kevin, one quick question. Um, of, of course, every player is different. Um, mm -hmm. How quickly can you actually see the impact that it has? Like when you see a player, I, of course, you, you, you're playing with the, you're coaching at professional level, of course, but even with amateur kids as well. How quickly can you see that they're actually making better decisions because they're making a much more conscious decision to actually scan. Are they mm -hmm. playing the ball more forward or are they playing more through passes or, or can you talk a little bit about that? Generally, you start seeing players just seem like they're a little bit more composed because also they're known what's going around them and, and yeah, they tend to use the ball better or retain the ball better. 
Um, but, you know, that comes back to, you know, can we separate the execution and the decision element? Because we can put this in the locker, but, you know, if, if you haven't developed them technically proficiently with the ball, you know, they can look about all they want, they're still not going to execute a good pass necessarily. Sure. So the, the, everything's, it's, everything's linked together. But you can, with some players, you can see really quick games. It's like any training program. You, you, for some players, you'll see really quick games. Uh, games. Others will be slower, depending on how blank a slate you've got, etc. Um, but players, players, particularly young ages, players are, are, are like sponges. They soak up things more than aware. I mean, me personally, the youngest player I've ever done a little bit with is a seven-year-old in a session, and they got it. Now, that's not to say they executed it perfectly. You know, that's not to say that they did it every time. But they got the idea of what they were meant to be trying to do. And they did it well sometimes, and they did it well most other times. But that's learning. You know, um, I've had people that, that have worked with six-year-olds feeding back to me and saying, again, similar things. And generally, the players enjoy the sessions because they're getting challenged in a different way, and it can be fun, and it's enjoyable, and you set the tone as fun. Even when I go into work, because I've, I've went into various professional clubs and done sessions and the tone that you set at a professional level is very much the same tone that you need to set in the very first session compared to the youngest the kids that you work with. You create a fun environment for them where they enjoy it and they, there's no fear of failure, etc. Because particularly at a professional level, there's a fear of failure. There's a fear of looking bad. There's a fear of not, um, not looking competent. Um, so you've got to set the tone right and make sure the players understand we're having fun, that you're not trying to mock them, you're not trying to make a fool of them, because they're going to make a lot of mistakes here. Um, but once you've set that and you've got the players practicing it, it's like everything else. How often are you going to do it? If you're doing it, we, we did it every day. We do it every day. We incorporate it every day, whether it's in the 4v4 plus 3, whether it's a, a possession exercise. We will do a little bit every day whether it's maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes as part of the warm-up or part the bit after the warm-up, that's what we did at Thistle as well. Um, so how often are you doing it and how much are you doing? You know, because I remember chatting with a guy on the pro license. He said he loved vision awareness. Uh, it was so important. Uh, it was really important. And he had a session that he worked on with, with his players. And so he explained the session. I listened intently and asked him, how often do you do it? And he said, about once a season. <laughs> right, so if you're going to work on this once a season, how, 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 often, how realistic are you in going to change players' habits or even develop a habit if you do it once a year? You know, so I'm a big believer in, believer in the everyday effect. There's something that you do little and often, you're going to get better at it than something you do once a week, once a month, once a year. But again, players will be in different. Some take it straight away and they get it straight away. Others take time. But as, as coaches, if we can be there to, to help support them through that learning process, they'll get there. Now, that's not to say they're all going to get to Zabby level scanning. But as they develop and get through the game, can we get as close to that as possible? So, so I probably haven't answered your question. Sorry. Yeah, so, um, Kevin, there's a question uh, that, that a couple of people wrote in here. Char Charles Wilson wrote, uh, this is fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. How much would you introduce in a first session for younger players, eight to 12, who haven't thought about this before? A single aspect of level one, perhaps? He puts a question mark. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, you eight, certainly you're, you're really working on level. And again, all players are going to be different, but you eight, you can, uh, you know, science would say they don't really understand tactical concepts and game understanding at those ages. So, how far are you going to get into the level two process anyway? So really, you, you, you're trying to build in the foundations of level one there. So, so just looking about, looking away from the ball as often and as frequently as possible yeah. at the right time. So, and again, really, that, that, that would be all it's about, depending on your players' needs. Now, if they're proficient at scanning away from the ball on a regular and consistent basis, you could progress the demands. Um, so it's like into, within the needs of the players, start as, at the low level and then you're able to the best way I can put it is that even when I work with professional players I start at the same level as I do with seven year olds yeah right the only difference with professional players is I can go through my progressions quicker right and in one session I might have got through uh, notional numbers here to progression six but with young players 
I maybe only get progression one. So, you know, for young players, I'm maybe just at the basic exercise. So uh, you, you often find that the higher the age groups, maybe just the slightly quicker, the slightly quicker you can go through your progressions. But again, it's always got to be the, the needs of the players. But I never expect that the players are all 100% successful because that's not going to happen. And that's not how learning works either. You know, so. And then Mick, Mick has a question. Do you have any online resources for creating small-sided games with focus on scanning? And I would say the book does. You've got tons of them yeah. in here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, there's plenty of examples in the book. Yeah, I had a couple of DVDs that I, I brought out in 2010 that I worked with the Irish FA, and they've got some basic exercises and formats. Everything, every exercise that I try and use Pretty much a lot of coaches are using similar exercises. I mean, this book, again, not to embarrass you, but this is like a Bible, man. I mean, this is so well done. Um, uh -huh. You know, I'm very, very, and, and where to buy, where to get this book is at Soccer Tutor. Yeah, well. yeah. So, so you go to them. I mean, it's also available on Amazon and all that kind of thing. But if you go to Soccer Tutor, they're the, they're the publishers. They do a package where uh, a, a hard copy, because I'm an old fashioned, I'm an old fart. I, I like a, a book to flick through. But they do a party where you can get their ebook as well. And you kind yeah. of get that through the other the, the other suppliers. But you get that. So you get an instant download and access to it. But yeah, the, the examples that are in there and what I say as well in, in the book, uh, the book was the, uh, there. So the coaches had 101 exercises to copy and paste. Although there is exercises that they can copy and paste. The, the book, I've tried to pitch it where I show you what I do, why I do it and how I do it. And then any exercise that you've got, whether it's a drill, whether it's an unopposed exercise or whether it's an opposed exercise, you can see how you could try and implement it into those sessions that you already use. So it's not that you need to go, oh, that's my favorite session. I need to throw that. No, here's your favorite session. How can we add in layers to that to challenge the players further and promote more scanning? So, and I could see the, the thing from Everett, where can it be built into 1v1s, 2v1s? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's again in the book, it kind of illustrates that the numbers that you have in sessions can change vary. Like in the book, I use a lot of six V3s, but I emphasize in there, change the numbers to suit your players. Uh, if they're struggling with the scanning and they need a bit more time, make it six V2. If they're getting good at it, make it six V4, make it six V5, make it even numbers. So the way you adapt the exercises as coaches is up to you. But yeah, they've got to be good not just in isolation and not just unopposed, they've got to be able to do it under pressure as well. So whichever format you use for your players, hopefully there's something there for everybody. Yeah. Um, Kevin, one mm -hmm. quick question here. Um, how much do you um, speak to the players I was just gonna ask that. About, <laughs> about, about how deep do you go into the topic with them and how, how how do you make it more deliberate for them so they're not just maybe doing the exercise, which is very deliberate by nature, right? But how do, how do you get them to become more deliberate about this? Besides, uh, you know, having very deliberate uh, trainings. Yeah, well, well taught them and reinforcing it on a consistent basis, like, you know, with the players and after each game, we'll give the video sessions. I'll highlight passages of play with, with certain players and, and look, you know, you went there, you could have turned into all this space. Even in the training session, the training session we had yesterday, we said say to, to uh, our centre midfielder, I said, you remember that? You popped it back to Amanda there. I said, yeah, that's 20 yards of space to, to open up and move into. And she's like, I didn't realise. I said, well, why didn't you realise? I didn't look. So it, it happens, you know, and all you can do, you're not criticised, you're just raising awareness for them, right? Remember, can you have a look? Can you have a look? Because it'll open options for you. It'll help you make more effective decisions. So, and with the video feedback, is great. I can highlight things. Well, look, look at all that space that you had to turn into there, but you put the ball there, or you did this, or you did that. Why, why did that? I didn't look. So once they become their own coach, they become better at it. And it still takes a process because the first team level, they've got bad habits. You're trying to change them. So it's a process. But through that, talking to them, reinforcing them, I mention it every session. We do it every session with the gloves. We use the gloves every training session. We use it for part of this, not the whole session, for part of it. A lot of the time it's in a 4v4 plus three. So we're reinforcing the scanning and the need to scan in every single session. So the players go, this is part of the identity of our team that we're wanting players to look at. No, they at the level that, that I want them to get to. No, 
but that's a process. So they understand the input. We've laid that as part of our principles. Scanning is part of our principles. Planning, scanning is, is part of what we do and one of the concepts that we have in, in the game because of what it opens up for you. So by doing that and reinforcing that message on a daily basis, players slowly get it. At Dundee, at, at, at Partick Thistle, and I talk about this in the book, Jackie talks about it as well. We had a player, Paul Payton, um, and he was a right back for us, and he struggled horrendously to start with, with the session. He didn't like the sessions. Why? Because he was where his comfort zone. He was, didn't he scan as often as he should. And we walked to him and he had to do them, because, had to do the session because Jackie was like, boys, this is what we do. This is part of what we do. This will make you better players. Jackie, Jackie had a decent career. He was like, this would have made me a better player. I wish I had this. We're doing this every day. So every day we did it. And to be fair, and Pates, Kept going, kept going, got better at it, got better at it, got better at it. And then the second season, the new players that had come in through the summer in the sessions, he was coaching the players now. And they said, right, what do you think about it? You need to do that. And he's doing his job. And we moved them from right back to centre midfield. Right? And he was a key player for us. He would get the ball and boom, switch it. Boom, boom. Awesome. He had the technical ability as a player, but he wasn't scanning. He wasn't updating his picture enough. So he wasn't able to maximise the use of this technical ability that he had. So this now being better at scanning and looking around more frequently opened up this door to him to really maximise the benefit of his passing range and what he could do with the ball. And then when we moved to Dundee United, he was Jackie's first sign at Dundee United. That, that, you know, Dundee United were in the Premier League, Park Thistle were in the Championship. So that was a move to that, a bigger club, and he was Jackie's first signing. So he went from being a right back that really was limited in relative terms to what he could do with the ball, to getting moved into centre midfield and becoming a playmaker for us almost, to then being the first signing at the next big club. And then he went on to play international football. And this isn't to say that the scanning thing was the only thing, right? Jackie put a lot of things in place. It was one part of the jigsaw, but for him, it was an important part of his jigsaw to help him add something to his game to become a better player. And so, and credit to him, because ultimately it's down to the players' hard work. You know, we, we, we as coaches can put on sessions, but it's down to the player themselves to become a better player. And he had the right mindset, much as he was resistant to, to start with, he was determined to be in the team. So he was determined to get better at this and it helped him. So, um, you know, it's, I can't even remember where I started. But I, I have Billy Connolly moments. Sorry, Paul. I have Billy Connolly moments where I start waffling on. I forget where I started from. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Um, hey, John, John, I know you have a question. I, I do. Kevin, great stuff. And I'm a big believer of what you're promoting here. I, I coach at the foundation level and really try to keep it simple and deliberate for the young guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there like a cheat sheet that talks about two to three good scanning habits by position but with intended purpose so what do i mean by that like for example you know biggest frustration at the youngest ages attackers you know frontline players scanning across the field to consistently maintain on sides or midfielders to consistently scan to find good spaces to run between defenders to maximize time and space to make the best decisions Mm -hmm. or backs to, to scan where attackers are to lessen vulnerability and transition, right? So are there any two to three tips, nothing more, but at the foundation level that we can give specific players in specific positions to help them, you know, be a better player at those positions with the purpose of scan? Well, one, you could um, understand the position. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, my, my earphones went a bit funny, sorry. Um, we're on about position specific, and you've mentioned foundation and, and younger ages. To me, back to, to the, what I think I said during the presentation, I would re rather just develop the scanning skills, and then they could bring that to their position. And wherever they might end up in the future, because they might be a defender just now, but end up as a midfielder. They might be a striker just now, and they end up as a, as a, a, a centre-back um, the, the, uh, See, names escape me. Big German boy. Um, started off as a striker, 
won a World Cup as a centre half, and all of that happened because he was asked to fill in as a centre half at 17 years old, but not 19 years old, and been a striker up until that point. Hummels, Pat Hummels, I think it was. Um, so you never know where they're going to end up. So position specific, I tend, although I know what the scanning patterns and what you ask players to do, position specific, if they haven't got the fundamental skill and ability to look away from the ball in the first place, it doesn't matter when you tell them to look away from the ball and what to look for, because they've not got the ability to do it. So by teaching them the fundamentals of looking away from the ball on a consistent and continuous basis, when you plug them into whatever position they're in, then you can guide them to what to look for, because they've now got the skill and ability mm -hmm. to look for something. Whereas we're asking them to, right, okay, can you pay attention to that? The problem is they haven't got the ability to look away and tear their eyes away from this ball. Right? They don't do it. So we could say you need to pay attention to that. You need to pay attention to that. Need, but we haven't put the, in the toolkit in the first place the ability and habit, because we're trying to develop a habit here, a behavior that they'll take on the field, a habit of looking the ball away on a regular basis. Once we train the habit, we can then be more guided of when to look away, what to look for, who to look for, and where to look. And once, so develop the habit first, then we could do it because I guarantee if you ask the players the questions, what should, what should you do? I should look. What should you be looking for? I should be looking for that blind side run. They know the answers. They will know the answers, but they haven't got the ability to do it on the field. So the, the five key times that I highlighted were younger ages. You maybe just want to focus on the first four of when to scan. Okay. And then just developing that comfort of looking away from the ball. That's the first thing you need to do at the younger. This comfort, they don't want to look away from the ball. Why? Because we've always told them the ball is the most important thing. And in the game, pretty much it is. So they just want to look at that. And then we fostered the habit through a lot of drills of only looking at the ball and very rarely looking away. So we can get them used to that. Even when the ball is coming to them, players do not like looking away from the ball when it's coming to them because they want to watch all of it because they don't want to mess it up. Right, yeah. they want to watch it all the way in. Right, and the sooner we can help them get comfortable, take a wee quick look away, the better they'll be at it. And so, getting them used to that, developing that behaviour, that habit of looking away from the ball on a consistent basis, is the starting point. The position specific can be plugged in later, because without the fund fundamental ability to scan, that is, look away from the ball, doesn't matter what position they're in, they're never going to get it right. Oh, none of are going to get. They're very. They aren't going to get it right as often as they could or should. So those four, four, four key times. The first four, not the looking away when somebody's first touched. That's for more advanced players. Those four, four key times that I identified, and developing that comfort, providing an environment where they can explore this looking away from the ball on a regular basis, even as it's coming towards them. That will help them so much. Great. I hope that helps. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, Kev, um, this is fantastic. Um, and I could definitely stay on here with you for another <laughs> two hours, man, because I, I just, just love listening to you and, and gaining all this insight and, and knowledge. Um, I want to thank everybody for jumping on uh, today. And um, Hopefully it inspired you and uh, a little bit to, to, to give this, uh, give this a, a try if you haven't already. Um, and again, I would incredibly, incredibly recommend to, to go get this book. Um, it was, I'm, I'm reading it right now um, and highlighting all over the book. Um, and we're going to be implementing these ideas. We've already started, like I said, in the Academy, but we're, where we just got so much more knowledge and, and ideas right now. So excited to, excited to get on the training pitch, Kevin. <laughs> really excited. Yep, yeah, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And yeah, and, and, and again, you know, if, if people read the book, hopefully what it does is that they'll have exercises that they can use directly at the book, but also it'll hopefully provoke thought where they can go, you know what, I could add this into exercise that I'm already doing and that that was part of my aim. And then further, as a, a caveat to the right at the start, this is a way of doing it. I've found it's useful. I've found it works. Uh, I'm not saying it's the way. I'm, I'm sure there are other ways out there that, that people could explore this topic and help the players with. 
all. But I think as long as we agree this is important, then, you know, it's how do we then help the players with Well. Well, everyone, thank you. Thank you so much. If there's no other questions, uh, Kevin, uh, if you don't mind uh, staying on uh, for a few minutes with, uh, with Tom and I, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah. Paul, thanks no for problem. putting it on, Ben. It was great stuff. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Really, really, really en enjoyed this. Thanks for coming on, you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Cool.